put that there. And um, tonight I want to just talk about trusting in God, and it's such a simple thing, and yet it seems so hard to do at times in our lives, and different times, different circumstances can result in different things, but at the essence of everything, God wants us to learn to trust in Him, and to actually not just put a faith in Him that's, well, I, I believe in Him, but to trust in Him every, everything. And if the story in Joshua in the Old Testament, uh, Joshua 6, and you may be uh, quite familiar with this, it's when God says to Joshua, take all the Israelites into the Promised Land, and they came across Jericho, and God came up with this great idea, a great battle plan, and told them to, to walk around the city for six days, and then on the seventh day, walk around it seven times, but keep your mouth shut. So that's quite interesting that God came up with that plan, and to Joshua it would have been as crazy as when Noah said to the people of his day, it's going to rain, because it never rained up to that point. So Joshua had a plan from God to go into take the promised land, and it seemed a crazy idea, and sometimes God tells us stuff, or we read things in the Bible, and we're expected to trust God, and yet sometimes it seems so preposterous, so you know, unusual, that we're just not quite sure what to do. So I've put four things down here that may help us from Joshua's life and what he had to learn that may help us in trusting God more. So one of the first things Joshua had to learn in trusting God was to trust in God's promises. If you read, when we haven't read it out at the Tekken for a while, but it's worth reading the first, you know, few chapters, first ten chapters of Joshua to get the idea. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 2, God tells Joshua, He says, See, I have given Jericho into your hands, its king and its mighty men of valor. Right before Joshua went in, God said to him, I've already done it for you. I've done it. Just go get it. Now Joshua had a choice to make. Did he have to wait or did he want to go? Now in some cases, unless we see... If someone says, I've put a load of money in your bank account, trust me, just go spend it on the card. Some people might not have a problem with that. They just go straight out there and start going for it. Other people are different. But Joshua had to learn to trust God. The word trust there, in the Hebrew, is actually to be firm, to endure, to be faithful, to be true. To stand fast, to trust, to believe, and to have a belief. In essence, it's to just to put your trust in... Now, some of the hardest times in my life with my kids is when I've expressed a, a, for them to trust me and generally they, they often do. If I say trust me on this, they do. But there's been the odd time where they've hesitated. And only for a moment and then done it or whatever. But in that moment when I felt they didn't trust me, it was kind of bizarre. Because they've not really done anything except hesitate. And yet as an earthly father, it caused me concern. I wonder sometimes how much concern it, shows to, it is to God when we start hesitating on his promises. You see, he hopes being rock climbing with me since you were the age of three doesn't have a problem when it comes to rock climbing. She'll go up 35 metres uh, down in Brighouse, external wall, not a problem. She'll trust me. But other times when I say, trust me, and she won't jump a gap. <laughs> it's like, you'll go so high, trust me. And everyone's different, but God wants us to trust Him. He wants to trust in His promises. I was reminded uh, this week of something on UCB2 radio, and it was talking about songs that you used to sing at school, or songs you used to sing when you were young in church. Now, in my school, we used to still sing, especially in, in junior school, and, there's a, and it really brought back to mind, not the songs they were playing, but a song that I actually do remember singing at school, and it's a song you may even know it, Oh Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master, my friend. And it continues, but the opening like, Oh Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end. And as I am driving and listening to the radio talking about these things, I thought to myself, Jesus, I promise. This was before I was even a Christian. I promise to serve you to the end. And in that moment in my time, as, as the week was going, I was having the best of weeks, but I was having the worst of weeks, running parallel together. 
And I just reminded myself that I'd made a promise to God that I would serve him to the end, come what may. Joshua had to learn to trust in God's promises. The truth, uh, truth is actually the, the essence of God's nature. You know, God cannot lie. So if he cannot lie, his promises can be trusted. We read this in Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he, should, that, that he does not lie, or so that he does not lie. He's not a human being that he changes his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? You see, some people promise stuff to us. I promise, not the, the minute, I forgot who's by. But you've got a long list of people promising things, but you know they're not going to do it. I promise you I'll do it, and you know, I promise I'll come back as he gets on the ship in the Navy. He's not coming back. I promise to love you to the end while he's got an eye on somebody else. There's all these promises, but yet God's promises stand through to the end. And then whatever he promises, he will always carry it out. In Titus 1 verse 2, it says this, This truth gives us confidence that we may have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. We all trust in the fact that God said he'll save us. We're all trusting that there is an heaven beyond those sheets as they come down. We're trusting in God and the fact that he, will, he has saved us and that he's got a place for us. We trust in that. And yet, that's in the time to come. But God wants us to trust him in the now. You see, to look for proof that we can trust in God's promises is to look back. Now I know, I know this morning I took the reverse. Forgetting what is behind us, we push on. But I did say, didn't I? I did say, it's, you know, it's good to have a good testimony and to think of the good things God's done for us. We're not told to look back and re in regret, but we can look back in the good things God's got for us. In Joshua 1, uh, verse 2, Joshua would have remembered, God told him, he says, Therefore arise and go over the Jordan, you and all the people, into the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that your soul of your foot treads, I will give to you. Joshua would remember that God's already said, I've done it for you. It's good to remember all the good things that God's done for us. It keeps you going. When you're in a dark place, you need to look back and think, what has God done for me? What good things has he done for me? We need to count our blessings. That's an old song, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not going to sing that one. Count me blessings, count me one by one. It's a chorus from a hymn. But we sometimes need to be reminded to count our blessings. And there's a, there is a chorus that I used to sing, or I used to lead worship. It says, I am blessed, I am blessed every day of my life. I am blessed. And it continues. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves that God's done some good things for us. And if God's done some things, good things for us, then we can trust in his promises. We can be assured of his promises. So Joshua had to learn to trust in God's promises, and we need to learn to trust in God's promises. The second thing Joshua had to learn is to trust in God's plan. His plan was always, you know, God's plan is always to our advantage. God's purpose in our life is always to our advantage. Well, God's plan may seem a bit, in you know, odd or a bit complicated sometimes. We need to just rest in the fact that he will always do what's best for his children. Some of the fathers are not like that, but God is. There's a verse in Isaiah 55, 8, it says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways, your ways, says the Lord. Sometimes God does things and says things which are a little bit outside of our thinking. The old phrase, you need to think outside the box. God's always thinking outside the box. And yet when that verse is quoted in the New Testament, people say our thoughts. You know, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And we don't really know what God's thinking. Well, actually, if you read a little bit further than that, it actually says that we can God will actually let us know what his secrets and his thoughts are. In the Old Testament, people didn't know what God's thoughts were. But in the New Testament, we can learn God's thoughts. A great verse that we often like to hold on to. It's a great one. Slightly out of context, I know. But Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans, to, plans for a wholeness and not for evil. Plans to give you a future and a hope. God has got a plan for us, he's got a purpose for us, we looked at that this morning. And another cracking verse from Romans, 
Romans 8, 20, another verse I had this morning. It says, we know that in all things God works together for, for the good of those who love him. For those who are called according to his purpose. Everything, if we trust in God, it will always work it around for our benefit. And it will always work it around for his glory. And sometimes we will think we've gone into a dead end. We'll think that, you know, I've been hurt. This, this situation's happened in my life. But in trusting God, God will always turn it around for, for his glory and for our good. God's plan as well in our life is never designed to exalt us. I think one of the reasons why God's plan seems so odd sometimes is so we can't take credit for it. Sometimes it's so simple or sometimes it's so complicated. Something God does in my life is so complicated, it's definitely not me. Because I can't think that far ahead. And yet sometimes it's so simple that we can just trust in God. God will never share his glory with anybody. And when the children of Israel went into to, to the promised land to go around Jericho, before the walls came tumbling down, he wanted the people to know they could trust him. And what he said was true, but he wasn't going to share his glory. Joshua wasn't going to go on going, look what I just did. He was going to go, this is all God's. In fact, later on, uh, he got into trouble because he started trying to take things for himself. Another thing that Joshua had to learn and that we should learn to, to learn, learn to learn, is to trust in God's power. God's power is actually without limit. God is not like a battery that fades after a while. You see, you see people on the phone when the phone's dying because they panic. Starting to, have you got a charger? Have you got a charger? It's like their entire life's just sucking away as that battery goes down. Or the tablet, they're in the middle of something, the tablet's going down. It's like oh, almost it's the end of the world. I mean, if you're from my generation or above, we never had these batteries run out, but we did have the power, would always seem to go out when you're watching a great film. And in both days, you couldn't record them. And if, especially if it's a very <coughs> decent film, once it, you know, once it were gone, it might not be around again for another six months. And the power would go out. God's not like that. God doesn't run out of power. And this is the amazing thing. If God's doing some great things on one side, some people think, well, God can't do it in my life because he's running out of power. A lady came out for prayer last week. It was quite interesting. So I said to her, I goes, what would you like prayer for? And she just looked at me and said, where should I start? I says, try the top and work to the bottom. I says, there's a lot of things wrong with you. She says, yes, a lot of things. I says, so what do you want Jesus to do for you right now? And she went, my knees are hurting. My knees are hurting. I went, we can pray for that. But what about the rest? She says, well, I think God's busy. I mean, if you believe in God for your knees, you might as well believe for a lot. And yeah. So I says, forget that rubbish. I said, I'm going to pray top to bottom. How's that? She goes, well, I'm not sure God can do it all. Well, it can either, he can either do it all or not do any of it. Mm. To me, it's a full package. You get that. So I prayed for wholeness. And she, <laughs> this is what made me laugh. She says, after I prayed for her, she goes, my knees are feeling a lot better. I goes, what about the rest of you? She goes, I'm not believing for that stuff. <laughs> But she got a knee. I think if you bleed, if you bleed, if you just get your mouth shut, yeah. maybe. But hey, we're just going to trust in God. But God's power is without limit. In Psalms it says this, How great is the Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond our comprehension. The message puts it this way. Our, our, our Lord is great with limitless, limitless strength. We'll never comprehend what he knows and does. God's power is limitless. I mean, any day, not only is he spinning the universe around and the planets and all the solar system, the galaxies and stuff like that, which is quite impressive. Yeah. But in the Bible, it tells us, tells us that he holds everything together. So that nucleus, that proton and neutron are spinning around each other. This is chemistry for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, nobody knows how these two atoms, in a sense, hold together. They're so tiny. If you blew them up to the size of tennis balls, one would be here and one would be at the back of the church. And that spins and that makes up an atom. You don't look too convinced. But they don't know what holds them together. Because it spins around its should part. 
But gravity isn't enough to keep them together. It's Jesus. Jesus all things together. It's amazing when you really get into biology and, and microbiology, especially how you can see the fingerprints of God all the way on there. It's amazing. But we can trust in God. And His power, God's power, is actually personal. You know, well, God ultimately wins battles for us. He allows us the privilege of being partakers, isn't it? He could just sort it all out for us. But He wants us to be involved in it. He wants us, first of all, to ask and talk to Him about it. But He also wants us to be involved in just believing and trusting in Him. There's a verse on the wall here. Yeah, there it is. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. Now, personally, you could say that I can do all things and Johnny, I'll operate on your brain. I'm not going to let you do that. Because as much as you might believe that verse, there's certain things around it. That God wants us to trust in him and do the things he's asked us to do. In 2 Corinthians it says this, that we are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualifications come from God. In ourselves, we can't do anything. But in Christ, we can do all things. Something else that we need to learn. So we've looked at, where are we? Joshua learned to trust in God's promises. But also, Joshua learned to trust in God's plan. And then we've gone to another one somewhere around here. And I'll find it later on. We'll go to number four because I can't find number three. Okay, number four. <laughs> Sorry, number three was he trusted in power. Number four was he learned to trust in God's provision. I think this is probably one of the most important ones. That we need to learn in God's provision. Because God just wants us to be there with him. You know, obedience comes before provision. The people marched, were told to march around and not say a word. I think that's partly because God didn't want them gossiping, he didn't want them chatting with doubt and unbelief coming in. He just wanted them to be quiet, get on with it and do the job. But he just wanted to trust. But to God, obedience is the essential thing. He wants us to trust him and be obedient to him. So when he says something, he wants you to do it, he wants you to obey him because it's a sign that you trust in him. He trust in him. In, Samuel, in 1 Samuel 15, 22, uh, Samuel re replied, uh, What is more pleasant to the Lord? Burnt offerings and sacrifices. I'll pause there. For, because in the Old Testament, people used to think, as long as you bring in burnt offerings and sacrifices, it will please him to God. And even in the church today, people often think, as long as I'm doing something for God, he'll be happy. As long as it's costing me something, he'll be happy. If I'm suffering a little bit while bringing a sacrifice, God will be happy. But he says this, you know, what is more pleasing to the Lord, burnt offering and sacrifice, or your, or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifices, and submission is better than the offering of fats of rams. God's not bothered about what we offer him if it's not in obedience. If it's not in obedience, God's not really impressed. You know, the reason why Cain and Abel had those issues is because Abel brought what God required, where Cain brought what he wanted to bring. And what Cain wanted to bring was his hard work. I've planted these seeds, I've grown these crops with the help of watering and the sun, and I've brought these to you, God, and God said, I'm looking on that one with favour. I'm in a lamb. Abel didn't do anything, by definition. The, the ram and the hue did all the work, and then she did all the work. The lamb was born, all they had to do was look after it. He didn't have to really feed, he couldn't feed it, he just looked after it. And then he brought it to God as a sacrifice, and God said, I'm happy there, but I'm not happy with you, Cain. And it caused Cain to kill his brother, because Cain had brought what he thought was best. But to obey is better than sacrifices. And when God's asking us to do things, He wants us to trust Him because it shows our obedience. God knows, this is one of the great things when it comes to just being obedient to God, is God knows how to finish the job. God knows how to finish the job. 
A great verse in Philippians, it says this, this is 1 verse 6, it says, Be confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The message puts it this way, There has never been the slightest doubt in the mind that, um, in my mind, that God, the God who started it, this great work in you will keep at it and bring it into fruition, finish, on the day of Jesus Christ when he appears. Everything God starts, he finishes. So if you start to sweat in your life, in God's eyes, he's going to finish it. The plan's already set. It's time to walk in it. All we've got to do is trust in him. All we've got to do is walk with him. So to bring this all to an end, God has promised, God has a promised place for every Christian if they are willing to be faithful. The bottom line, what, what can God do through you? And what can God do through this congregation over the next 12 months if we are willing to, be, to radically trust him in all that he tells us to do? In everything he's got for us. Hebrews 12 verse 1 and 2 is a great verse. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us look to Jesus, trusting in him, trusting in his power, in his provision, in his promises, trusting in everything that God's got for us. That's God's heart for us, that he just wants us to trust him. It's not complicated. Okay, God, I'm going to trust in you. The problem is that when you're banging your head against the wall because you can't work it out, that's usually a good time to go. Throw that prayer and go, God, I'm going to trust in you. Yeah. That's not an excuse to do nothing. But it is a good case for us to say, God, I'm just going to throw aside the weight and everything else that ensnails me. And I'm going to trust in you. Amen. Amen.